I'm back. Uh, welcome to Love Goes Live. My name is Mark Lubquitz. I'm a molecular biology professor at St. Michael's College. And the fact that I'm making videos again means, yes, of course, that we're in quarantine. Uh, I did get some emails from some students asking me to explain how the two vaccines that we've been reading about, one produced by Pfizer, the other by Moderna, works. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. So without any further ado, let's look at RNA-based vaccines and the mechanism behind them. Um, give me a second here to share my screen, if you could, please. All righty. And perfect. And let me get a pointer here. Always good to have a pointer. All right. And we are off and running. Okay. Any successful viral infection requires a couple different things, but step one is the virus has to actually attach to human cells. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, that is um, done by a protein that's called the spike protein, which is here in red. So this is a, a cartoon rendition of, of what um, SARS-CoV-2 looks like. And this spike protein binds to a receptor. It can bind to a couple different receptors, but the main receptor is called ACE2, which is found in a lot of different human cells. And interesting enough that the spike protein, um, I guess the people that originally des described it thought it looked like a crown and hence the name coronavirus. If you've seen other Love Goes Lives, you might've seen me show this image before, but this was on the cover of Science several months ago. This is the surface of a human cell. This is what ACE2 actually looks like. Here is SARS-CoV-2, and here is the spike protein. And you can see the spike protein docks right in there. Um, I stole another image from Science. This is a much closer, highly refined image of the spike protein. This is ACE2, and of course, this is how they dock together. And notice this region right here, this region I'm highlighting with my pointer, that's the receptor binding domain. So that's the part of the spike protein that interacts with the receptor ACE2 on our cells. So if you can prevent this interaction, that's the big point here. If you can prevent this interaction, the viral particle will not bind to your cells. If they do not bind to your cells, they can't get into your cells, they don't get into your cells, case closed. Okay, so all the vaccines that I'm aware of are focused on the spike protein. That is trying to make having your body produce antibodies that will recognize specifically this green region up here, which is the receptor binding domain. And let me explain it for a second what antibodies are. So inside of your body, you have a population of cells um, that are called naive B cells. And, and I, I like to think of these cells, um, uh, they're sort of like, like 18 year old um, first year students in college. They haven't quite determined what they're gonna do with their lives yet and they have a lot of potential. And so the total population of the naive B cells in your body has the genetic potential to make over a trillion different antibodies. And what they do when they choose their fate in life, and it takes about two weeks to do that, is they differentiate and develop into what are called plasma cells. And plasma cells will do one thing and one thing only with, their, with the rest of their existence, and that is they will make one type of antibody. Now, what is an antibody? An antibody is a protein, first of all, and it looks um, remarkably like a Y, and it binds to whatever it is that your immune system thought, this doesn't belong here. So in this case, if your immune system saw, saw the spike protein, it would recognize this doesn't belong, belong in my body. Some of the naive B cells would become plasma cells. Those plasma cells would make antibodies. Those antibodies would then coat that viral particle. And then your immune system would recognize that as not being, not being welcome in your body and would mount um, attack against it. All right, so here's the big idea. If you have antibodies against the spike protein, you will most likely have some level of immunity to SARS-CoV-2. All right, so let's go back to that to that uh, that image from science. So here's ACE2. Here's the spike protein um, on a viral particle. Remember, to get the infection, those two have to come together, right? So this is the interaction that has to occur. Here's the receptor binding domain binding to ACE2. And in the perfect world, what you want to do is you want to have antibodies that you've made from your naive B cells that became plasma cells. Those antibodies will coat that spike protein. Boom, it's neutralized. It can't bind to ACE2 and you've stopped the infection. Okay, so with respect to vaccination, there's a lot of, lot of different types of antibodies your body can make. Actually, not that many, five, five, five major categories. Um, IgM, IgG are two of them. So when you get vaccinated over about a two week time course, your body will start to produce antibodies and then those cells will live in your lymph nodes. And then the second time that you're exposed to the spike protein, presumably the second time it will be actually by being exposed to the virus, your immune system will, will mount a huge response. And then those antibodies that are being produced by those plasma cells will coat that viral protein and keep it from binding 
to the ACE2 receptor. Okay, let's do a deep dive now into how Moderna and Pfizer each um, produce a vaccine that's gonna get your body to produce antibodies that recognize the spike protein. So these are RNA-based vaccines, which are new. They, um, they were first approved by the FDA, I think in 2018, so they're really new. Moderna's vaccine is called mRNA-1273. It's a messenger RNA-based vaccine. And what they've done is this. So I'm gonna first go over just the general principle, then I'll do um, a little bit more of the details. So they have part of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. In fact, they just have the RNA just for the spike protein. And the idea is, is that this will get injected into you. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, and then the target is to get into certain types of cells from your immune system. And um, these are called dendritic cells, APCs, macrophages. But what they do is they essentially show the rest of your immune system what doesn't belong here. Okay, so this messenger RNA will get into these cells, right, be taken up by these cells, and then the machinery in these cells will take this messenger RNA, which is, which is really just a template for making a protein, and these cells will make the spike protein. And then what they'll do is they will take that spike protein and they're gonna put it on a display case. And this is, the display case actually has a name, it's called MHC1 and MHC2. Let's just call it the display case. And so these immune system cells will put this, this spike protein on the display case. And do you know who they're gonna show it to? They're gonna show it to T cells. Now, for my immunology friends out there, I know I'm going to take a little bit of liberties here. There's a lot of different types of T cells, so, so work with me. But essentially, these immune system cells are going to put the spike protein on a display case and show it to the T cells and say, hey, you know what, T cells? This protein doesn't belong here. This is not part of my body. Beware. The T cells are then going to communicate that information to, to naive B cells. Naive B cells are then going to differentiate and produce antibodies that recognize that spike protein. And so the next time, hopefully there is a next time that, that SARS-CoV-2 enters your body, those antibodies will be ready to neutralize it and keep it from binding to your cells. Okay, here's the million dollar question though. Messenger RNA is one of the most unstable molecules you could ever wanna work with. It's like a nightmare to work with as a scientist. So how do you get messenger RNA into a human cell, specifically into human immune system cells? And the technological um, advancement, if you will, is called or are called is called um, lipid nanoparticles. And um, for those of you who aren't molecular biologists, let's see if I can explain this. These little squiggly lines right here, these are fatty acids. So these are greasy molecules. And so you have this really greasy pocket in here. And then inside of this greasy pocket, you can tuck in messenger RNA. And these are tiny, tiny particles. And this is what actually is going to get injected into your arm. So this lipid nanoparticle, which has the messenger RNA, gets injected into your arm. Um, it gets taken up then or fuses with these uh, immune system cells, which will then take that messenger RNA, make it into the spike protein, put it onto the MHC display case, which will so show it to T cells, which will communicate to B cells, which will make antibodies. And then you're off and running. Next time you see SARS-CoV-2, neutralized. All right. Pfizer's strategy use is similar, but a little bit different. And it uses something called self-amplifying RNA or called SARNAs. Um, and the name of their vaccine is BNT162B1. No idea how they came up with that name. All right, so here we have the same lipid nanoparticle, but inside of it, instead of messenger RNA, this time it's gonna be self-amplifying RNA. Now, the, the goal is to end up in these same immune system cells. So these are your dendritic cells, your antigen presenting cells, your APCs, your macrophages, et cetera. And then once that self-amplifying RNA gets in there, what's gonna happen is, wait for it, wait for it. Boom, it gets amplified. So the RNA itself amplifies itself. And what that means is you'll make more spike protein. And then if you have more spike protein, you have more spike protein to put on, on the display case, the MHC display case which then it can communicate to T cells, hey, the spike protein doesn't belong here, which can then whisper to the B cells, which will make your antibodies. And next time you see the virus, you're good to go. Okay, so here's the question. How do you make RNA that self amplifies? And I think this is really, really clever. And what they did was they borrowed genetic, uh, they borrowed a genome from another virus. So there's a whole family of viruses called the alpha viruses. Um, you may have heard of them. There's uh, one of the alpha viruses causes chicken gunga disease. Um, another alpha virus, alpha virus causes venous swelling and encephalitis. And actually that's the one that was used. 
And the, the alpha virus genome is tiny, it's tiny. So it's an RNA-based virus. It has four genes that make replication machinery. So this is machinery just for copying the viral genome. So if this is a, a cartoon of the virus, here's the genetic material. These four genes, what they do is just make sure that this gets copied. And then there's five genes that make the protein coat, which you see here in green, um, and that's it. So nine genes, four for copying, four for making proteins for, for like packaging. And what Pfizer did was they removed all of these genes for the viral coat, so essentially everything that makes the green stuff here, and they replaced it with SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So look what they have now. They kept the four genes for copying, so you can copy, 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 but what is it copying? It's just copying the spike protein. So they took this cassette that they made, so it's, it's partially alpha virus, and then it's partially from the coronavirus. They put that into the lipid nanoparticle. That gets injected into your arm. It finds, it way, it finds its way to these immune system cells, which then take that up. So here's the piece for copying. Here's the piece for the spike protein. The copying piece says, okay, copy, copy, copy. You make tons of that, of that, of that viral genome, and then you start to translate the spike protein make lots of spike protein, put it on the, on the, uh, the pedestal, um, show that to the T cells, this doesn't belong here. T cells convey that to the B cells, B cells make antibodies, and you're off and running with respect to immunity. Okay, that's how it works. Um, it's good to be back. Actually, it's not really good to be back. I really wish I was back on campus, but um, I'm gonna put on a, a brave face and say that it's good to be back. Uh, my name is Mark Lubquitz, coming from St. Michael's College. And as always, trying to let crisis bring out the best of me and rising from the ashes like the phoenix. I'll see you soon.